Hello friends, welcome to Coding Garden. Uh, we're out early to catch the sunrise and also answer some of your coding questions. So let's get to it. So first question comes from Adam.dev and he asks, is that a dog head on a horse body? Uh, it's not, it's my dog Panzer. He's a St. Bernard. Uh, we also call him Pig because he makes lots of pig noises, but he is a giant dog and he slobbers a lot and he gets hair everywhere, but he is the most loving and intelligent dog I've ever known and I love him. Next question is, do I go camping often? Not really, uh, pretty much just once a year. This year we're going twice a year. And uh, several years ago, I used to go fairly often, like four or five times a year, if you can call that often, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, th these days, usually the, the trip is to uh, hang out with some old coworkers. Um, I used to work with them uh, about three years ago, three, four years ago. And uh, this is a, a good opportunity for us to meet up and just catch up on each other's lives and, and stuff like that. I have a really great group of like lifelong friends that I met while working a, a job a few years ago. So it was a great opportunity for that. And pretty much everyone that I worked with also is fairly outdoorsy and is uh, a good, good camping mate. If you're thinking about camping and you haven't been camping before, I would say you should at least go camping once in your life. There's a lot of different levels of camping. So the camping I'm doing here is known as car camping. Basically your tent is maybe 20, 30 feet away from your car. So uh, if you wanna go sleep in your car, you can do that. Uh, if you wanna bring an entire mattress, you can do that. Um, for me, the, the one thing that made has made camping the most comfortable is I got a cot. And that was game changing. Because I mean, most people who talk about like sleeping during camping, it's basically just a running joke that you normally don't get very good sleep while camping. But ever since I got my cot, I sleep so good. <laughs> so I would recommend uh, as long as you can sleep comfortably, uh, you, you, can, you can have a really good camping trip. Um, and I, I would recommend it because uh, depending on where you go, you can get really cool uh, sites like this. And, and this, is all, this is all part of it, is uh, just enjoying the outdoors. Now I will admit there can be bad parts of camping. It could rain, it, things could be loud, it could be hot, it could be cold. But I, I guarantee there's at least one little bit of a, of a memory that you can, you can take for the rest of your life. Especially if you haven't done camping before. So this next question comes from Florin who asks, can you get a dev job with only knowing vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? So I used to work at a code school with Kyle, who I'm camping with, and uh, the code school was actually, it's a six month program, but it was split into four different sections. And the first section was all about front end dev, so HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And what Kyle would always say at the end of that first section is, you are now employable. Like it's absolutely possible to find a job only doing vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But of course, you're not gonna get paid as much. There aren't going to be as many opportunities. There are just some things you won't be able to do as easily with vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which is why we introduce frameworks and libraries and, and other things like that. But I just did a quick search while I was sitting at my campsite for jobs in my area. So I think this is the other aspect of the question is it also depends on where you live and what jobs are available to you. But if, if you have this question right now, go to whatever your preferred job website is and search for web developer or search for front end developer or search for UI developer. And you will find job postings where their requirements literally just list HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, you're probably also gonna see like jQuery or Bootstrap on that list. A lot of times these things are combined with vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for more basic websites. But jobs exist, so I, I found at least two job postings in the area that I live in where they're just asking for basic skills like that. Now, if you compare those salaries with uh, jobs that are asking you to know React or Vue or Svelte or uh, back-end languages like Java or C Sharp or Node.js, they're gonna pay more because you have to do more, 
usually they're gonna pay more, I'll say that, but typically because you have more responsibilities and it, they require the applicants to know more, they're pr probably gonna pay better. So yeah, short answer, yeah, you can find a job. It's probably not gonna pay as much, but some people that maybe are self-learning and don't have the time to learn full stack web development, it's possible for you to maybe get some contract jobs or, or get some work right now with what you know and then keep learning on the side. That's probably would be my recommendation is because I would think eventually you wanna make more money or advance, get a better job, and that is going to require more skills than just the basics. So that's kind of my recommendation is to learn the basics and if you need a job right now, find some contract work and then eventually learn all of the other stuff and get paid more and find better jobs and stuff like that. But thanks for the question, Fuller. This next question comes from Jacques who asks, how do you keep your peace of mind once you have completed a feature that you're working on? They mean, how do you know when a solution is good enough? And what do you do if you find a better solution in the middle of all of that? Do you start all over again? So first of all, there's two, two ways you can approach this because I think if you're talking about personal projects, that can be really hard because it's just something that you're interested in and something that you want to work on and so it's like you want it to be perfect. You want to do everything you can to make it the best possible thing. Now, in a professional setting, there are stakes, right? So there's a budget, there's time constraints, uh, there's a client who has needs, wants, desires. There's a, a dev team that also has needs, wants, desires. There's a product manager that has needs, wants, desires. And in the professional world, you have to balance all of that. So in my experience, in the professional world, something is done when it meets all of the success criteria that were set at the beginning when I set off to do a specific task. Now, if you're working on personal projects, you may not have that level of detail, but I would recommend it if you haven't done something like that. So for any given thing you're going to implement, you should have a list of success criteria that basically say, these are the things that need to be done before I can call this specific feature done. And in the professional world, that's how we communicate these things, right? So if as a dev, I pull a ticket, I do all the things it says, and then I put it in for review, if it gets kicked back to me to say, oh, well, you missed this and this, well, if it wasn't in the success criteria, how was I supposed to know that it needed to be done? Now, of course, uh, you can think for yourself, which is typically what I do, but a lot of times when you're collaborating on a team and everything else, you, you can't just assume things. You actually need to know, well, what do you, what do you want here? Well, what needs to be done here? So in the professional world, uh, good communication, good success, success criteria are kind of key to figuring out what needs to be done to get a feature done. In the agile world, there's actually a term for this. It's called done done. So is your feature done done? That means, uh, has it passed all the success criteria? Is it tested? Is it deployed? Like there's, there's multiple things you have to go through to really say a thing is done. And so to answer your question, how do you know when a solution is good enough? I, I really think good enough is, is that it works, right? So I think we, we often get caught up in the engineering and code aspect of programming instead of thinking about the end result, right? So the purpose of all the code we write and the apps that we build are that we are building something for people to use. We're building something that is useful for people and has a specific use. So to say something is good enough means that it fulfills that use. Now, you might be worried about, well, is it fast enough? Uh, does it scale? There's a, there's a lot of different things you would want to make sure you check the box of to say like, is it good enough? Now I think the other place that this question can come from is you've read, well, your code should be refactored really well and your code should be tested really well and your code should be as fast as possible. All of these things are a spectrum of good enough, right? And if the solution works, like if you've, if you've set out and you've met the goal of, the, of what you're trying to accomplish, then you can call that good enough. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be refactored in the best way or implement all of the best design patterns or anything else like that. So I think early on in your career, you can, you can get caught up in a lot of that, but the, the, the more experience you get, the more you realize good enough to me is the kind of just that it works for the intended purpose, right? And sometimes the intended purpose is it needs to scale or it needs to be fast, but that's not always the intended purpose. Or it needs to be a really well-structured code base because I'm working on a team of multiple people and they all need to be able to collaborate and add on to it. Like those are other aspects that aren't always the case in a specific code base. So if that's not the case, then you don't need to worry about that. Uh, so good enough, you have to define. And I think that's basically what you can do up front when you're going to work on something is set, it kind of like setting your success criteria, define what you determine to be good enough 
for what you're trying to accomplish right now based on your current skill set, based on what you're, you're building, all of that. And if you do that and you can check off that list and meet those success criteria, you can call that good enough. And this last piece here, so uh, they ask if you find a better solution in the middle of it, do you start all over again? It depends. I would say more often than not, I don't. <laughs> like That's a lot of extra work just to redo things that may potentially already work. And I think if we go back to what your definition of good enough is, uh, if you've defined that, then you may not need to rewrite or imp implement this new solution that you found. Because if what you've done is good enough, according to your own terms or according to the business terms, uh, then you can, you can stop there. Um, but yeah, rewriting, redoing, is almost never a good choice. Like humans are really bad at estimating and projecting and so you're like, oh, that looks super easy. I'll just, I'll just add this, it'll save me so much time. And then you spend more time trying to integrate it and implement it than you actually spent originally. And you could have just finished your existing solution. So, and, and ho hopefully that gets you kind of on the right track and thinking in the right way. Uh, because yeah, I know early on, especially if you haven't learned that concept of good enough yet or you haven't worked on a team where there are competing priorities and everything else uh, or you haven't used success success criteria and stuff like that I, I think those concepts will potentially help you in determining what is good enough and also determining should you start over sh if you find a a new or better solution so thanks for the question this next question comes from Rushikesh Ganesh and they ask uh, if someone come and I'm paraphrasing if someone comes from another industry and is trying to get into a thing company, and thing companies are typically product-based, so like Netflix, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they all have a specific product that they're working on and selling, and the devs there work on that specific product. So uh, Rushikesh's question is, how does someone go from some other industry to a product-based company? And I think the first answer is, a lot of companies hire software developers. They don't specifically hire product developers or people that already know the exact domain that you're getting hired for. So a, a lot of times domain knowledge is acquired when working on the job. So uh, just like you would need to learn the financial industry or, or the banking industry if you got a job at a bank, same thing, if you got a job at Netflix, you would need to learn, potentially, depending on what your job is, you'd need to learn about media delivery and then maybe embedded dev if you're doing like the TV app. And, and each one of those things is a, a possible different domain that you would need to learn about. So the short answer is most companies hire software developers. So the interview process is just going to be, are you a good and decent software developer that we can hire. And typically those companies have very computer science focused interviews and hire people in a in a way in, in that they're checking their computer science knowledge. So if you're looking to get a, get a job at a fan company, that's probably where you would start is make sure that you have a good foundation in computer science. There are many, many resources online that uh, tell you how to interview at companies like that. So uh, that would kind of be my first step is to, to look at those guides and then use them potentially as a learning plan to figure out what you need to learn in order to interview at a place like that. So yeah, short answer is you actually don't necessarily need to know the domain. You just have to know the computer science concepts and then the domain comes later and, and they typically expect that. Now, if you already know the domain, your, your name will potentially be at the top of the list of potential hires because that's one less thing that you need to be trained on or one less thing that you need to learn, but it's not the most important. For, for most, most any software job, the most important thing is that you know how to write software and you know how to work on a team. That comes first. The domain knowledge and everything else comes second and a lot of times you just learn that on the job. I just want to add on to uh, uh, tips for camping or like why I think you should go camping. Um, I think especially if you're really into video games, some of the sites and some of the outdoors that you can find are basically like a real life video game, right? So like, at least you see this, this pasture and those foothills and those rocks. It's basically like we're in a real life video game and, and, and you can probably see where a lot of video games got their inspiration from, which is the real world. So <laughs> I would recommend if you're, if you're into video games and you like the landscapes and stuff like that, uh, you can find a lot of that out, out in the world and uh, it's super fun. 
So that's it for this camping code Q&A. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. I, I just, I wanted to give it a try. I had the idea. Also, this is one of the first videos I've done with this kind of editing. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, I'd love to make a lot more. So leave a comment, share the video if, if you enjoyed it. Um, because I, I definitely enjoyed making it. Uh, and I'd love to do more. So we'll see you in the next one.